everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it is my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. Decree with me. The blood of Jesus avails for me. Defeat is not my portion. I will keep grace in my mouth. I will enter rest. I will stand still and see the salvation of God. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody needed to hear that and to say it. All right, turn with me if you're where you can get to a Bible and spend some time uh, looking at the Word as we read it. Acts chapter 7. And I want to start reading verses 22 through 25, or excuse me, through 35. This is where Stephen is speaking to the council of the um, Pharisees and all of those in which, you know, they eventually decided to stone him because they didn't agree with what he was saying. But he's giving them uh, the condensed version of the oral history, uh, bringing them up to the place to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's talking about Moses in this particular stretch uh, that I'm going to read to you today. Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 22, he said, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So he had a revelation, but he's not going about it the right way. <laughs> the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, so now he's eighty, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold, or in other words, he dared not look at it. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Wow. Now in verse 34 where he said, I am come down to deliver them. Deliver is from the Greek word exahireo and it means to deliver, to release, to pluck out, to rescue. So, as I've shared with you many times, God declares the end from the beginning. If you want to know what's going to happen in the end, you look at the beginning. And we see in this very vivid description the account where God sent an angel to appear in the fire, in the bush, to get Moses' attention. After Moses had been tending sheep for 40 years and had finally gotten a little bit of humility and part of the anger worked out of him. And he became a vessel that God could use to send back into Egypt to deliver the people, to rescue, to pluck out the people. So we see that this was God's will, and he used the partnership between the angel of the Lord, 
his man, his creature, his representative, and himself giving word and direction. Now, in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17, this is talking about an event in the life of Peter the Apostle. It says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So I think a quaternion was actually four soldiers, so four of four would be 16 soldiers guarding one guy. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, that's important because the prayer of the church, the ecclesia, is going up before God on behalf of Peter. When Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up, quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. So he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. He thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, You're mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. So then they said, Well, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, that verse 11 where he said, The Lord has sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod, it's that same Greek word, exahireo, which means to deliver, to pluck out, to rescue, and to release. Okay, let's look at another example. Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 19. Paul is recounting his own experience on the road to Damascus. He's talking to King Agrippa. Acts chapter 26, verse 12. He said, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Now, in case you don't know it, Paul is the one that received the revelation of the gospel of grace. He received it straight from Jesus' mouth through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you're wanting to find out about grace, you don't look at the Old Testament. You look at the epistles of Paul. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power or the authority or jurisdiction of Satan unto God, 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified or set apart by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Now again, Jesus himself, speaking unto Paul, said, Delivering thee from the people. Delivering thee, as Luke is writing this letter and conveying this to his friend Theophilus. It's that same Greek word, exahireo, and it means to deliver, to pluck out, to release, and to rescue. So we see that three different times, this same word is used in the book of Acts, and every time it is involved with uh, a powerful intervention either in the form of an angel or Jesus himself to minister that deliverance. And because this is after the resurrection, this is all new covenant activity. So, unto Paul was given the revelation of grace, and I want to state here that it takes grace to turn people from the power or the authority of darkness unto God and to deliver them from the devil's jurisdiction. And we cannot ever afford to forget that. Now, I read all that to get to this in Galatians chapter 1. And I want to read verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man. In, in other words, man didn't call him. Man did not appoint him. His apostleship was set up by the Lord Jesus Christ. I just read that to you out of the book of Acts where he had the encounter with Jesus. But by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. So that's his opening in the letter. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So Paul took this very seriously. If you read the language uh, that he used in the book of Galatians, he was more stern with them than he was any other group of churches that he sent epistles to because they were being coaxed back into mixing law and grace. And if you read Galatians with that understanding, you're going to find out that when he's talking about dealing with the flesh, it has to do with trying to get things done according to the works of the law. And he, was, he does the comparisons, he shows the contrast, and he affirms to them, there's nothing that avails anything in Christ Jesus except the faith which works by love. There's nothing that avails anything except the brand new creation in Christ. Well, all of that is not under the law. That's all under grace. What I want to point out and focus on today is verse 4, talking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, action taken in the past, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, actions to be taken in the present and in the future. He gave himself in the past that he might do something in the present. And it's that word, deliver. It's that same word, exahireo, and it means to rescue, deliver, pluck out, to release. And then he says, according to the will of God and our Father. Now, I am aware that primarily this is talking about him rescuing us from the sin element in the world, translating us into his dear kingdom. But I read you all of those other examples first to help you understand there's another level, another dimension to that deliverance that is also the will of God. And that will of God is that his people be able to be rescued, released from this present world, the evil that's in this world, because Jesus has already given himself for us for our sins in the past. This is why it's so important that we settle the matter once and for all, that we are forever forgiven because all of our sin was punished in Jesus' body on that cross. He bore our sin. He bore our sickness. He carried our disease. He was made the curse for us so he could redeem us from all of that. And then Paul is very specific by the Holy Spirit in this book of Galatians 
that he gave himself for our sins because he had an eye on the future. There's something else that still needed to be done that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Mm -mm -mm. What he does or wants to do in the present is possible because of what he did in the past. Now get this, it is the will of God for you to be released, plucked out, rescued, delivered from the present evil world. Now, does that mean that you leave the planet? No, not necessarily, not at this point. There are souls to save and thrones and principalities to overthrow and kingdoms to take. God needs us here right now. We're here for a reason. And it is the season for us to partner with the angel armies to spread the pure gospel of grace and to stand, therefore, till the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord. That world, that word world, in, used in verse 4, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, it doesn't mean the planet. It's from the Greek word aeon, which we would say aeon, and it means the age. It can mean world, but it also means the course. So the course that this world is on, this present age is taking, this Babylonian system. Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present world. So no matter which generation in which you live, he said this is the will of God for us to be delivered, rescued, released, plucked out. And it's important that we be willing to receive that. There are so many people that, that for, for one reason or other, and usually it's rooted in guilt and condemnation, not always, but a lot of times, they, they won't accept deliverance. They won't accept rescue. They don't think they've got the right to call out and ask for it or to receive it for one reason or another. But I just read you, it's the will of God that you be rescued, delivered. And this is something that you can be praying over yourself, praying over your family, praying over your church, praying over even your job. Let me read you something in the book of Titus, chapter 2, starting at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It's grace that brought the salvation. Don't ever forget that. Not works. Grace brought the salvation. And what does grace do? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So he wants us delivered from the evil of this present world, and he wants us to live righteous and godly in this present world. Well, the common denominator in all of that is grace. It's by His grace that we're saved. It's by His grace that we're going to be delivered. And it's by His grace that we're going to be able to live in spite of what's happening in this world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now, why would he want us zealous of good works? Well, for one thing, the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 21 that we are to overcome evil with good. So when he rescues, delivers us from this present evil world, part of the way that that happens is we overcome it by returning good for evil. The scripture also tells us in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 that it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So if we're preparing for revival, we're re preparing for the third great awakening, for the outpouring of the latter and the former rain, we are seeking the Lord to be purged of everything that would stand in the way of what he's wanting to do. One of the things that we have to be willing to face and let go of is that we cannot continue to hold people's behavior against them. And we cannot constantly want to be aware of their sin. We cannot constantly be throwing up the evil 
He wants us to understand our job is to present the goodness of God because the goodness of God is what leads people to repentance. And when they repent, then having received what Jesus has provided for them, then they're in position to be delivered from this present evil world. And it spreads like leavening. And that's what the kingdom is all about. Getting this good news spread so that it can release the people so that they can enjoy what Jesus paid with his life to provide for them. The Lord reminded me of something that he had spoken to me back in 2013. September of 2013, and he said, In my kingdom, the conscious choice to receive activates the flow of provision. Let me say that again. In my kingdom, the conscious choice to receive activates the flow of provision. That's one of the reasons that I encourage you to say, I receive that. He said, Declaring your acceptance is important. So, I want to encourage you today. Tell the Lord that you receive the deliverance, the rescue that His death and resurrection, that His blood has provided for you and for your family. Don't wait until you're in a crisis situation. Make that part of your declarations before the Lord and your conversations with Him, part of your praise and thanksgiving. Read that scripture in Galatians and get it settled in your thinking. It's God's will for you to be delivered, rescued, protected. Speak that out. Claim that. Tell the Lord you accept it and you receive it so that when this time comes that you need it, it's right there ready to be manifest. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and sing over you and discomfit your enemies. The Lord protect you and grant you accelerated restoration as he revives you and raises you up and causes you to live in his presence. In this third day generation, the Lord grant you wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God that you may possess the gates of your enemies. May you live to be 120. Amen, Sister Sherry. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we thank you that it is your will to deliver us. And we thank you that you're so determined to help us understand that this is your will. That you sent Jesus. And Lord, we're so thankful that you did not send him into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So, Father, today we just want to declare before your throne, we accept the rescue. We accept the deliverance from this present evil world. And we accept the truth that part of the way that that's going to happen is that as you inspire us and show us by your wisdom how to return good for evil, how to show people the goodness of God, help them taste and see that you're good so that they can be led into repentance. Lord, we thank you that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts and your heart is still reaching out to save nations. We thank you, Lord, that it's not over till you say it's over and you're the guy that can raise people from the dead when there's nothing but a valley of dry bones. We praise you for the grace, we praise you for the hope, and we praise you for the deliverance and the rescue in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, dear friend, I hope you have a wonderful day. I will talk to you later by God's grace.